Hello everyone, welcome back for uh, some more business ethics video lectures. Um, tonight, the um, the original plan was to finish up some stuff with Kant, see if, you, if there are any questions I could address um, about Kant, and then get rolling on Aristotle and see if we can't get most of the picture down tonight. That's kind of my ambition. Um, I think that's a little more doable with Aristotle than with the other ones, but um, but yeah, we'll see we'll see how it goes, and uh, maybe we'll need to do a little Aristotle finishing up on Thursday, um, and then uh, as I mentioned in the weekend update email, Thursday will also be um, doing kind of a broad overview of all the three big theories that we've studied from Mill, Kant, and Aristotle, and kind of try to put all the big pieces together to a certain extent, or kind of um, collect all the threads together and see if there's anything left over that we can talk about and clarify and things like that, which was kind of like what the Kant discussion board was supposed to be about. But um, we only got one reply to the Kant discussion board, which I'll admit um, made me a little disappointed. I was I was hoping for more response there. Um, I'm not sure if this is what's going on, but um, I thought since everyone has to watch these videos, I might make another a special impassioned plea for um, reading my weekend update announcements that I post. Um, I did, I've gotten a couple responses or conversations with people that have made me feel like maybe those things aren't being read. Um, but when I post announcements, please check those out, especially the weekend update ones, because I really try to let you know everything that's going on um, to help you stay up to speed on it and I know that that's a big danger with online classes from teaching them before and talking with many many students about the whole online experience and everything I know it's very easy for um, online classes to be one of those things that you sort of like get off the grid for a while and then catch back up to later <clears throat> but I'm really gonna be running the class uh, kinda up to the minute and expecting you to stay plugged in in a kinda up to the minute way as well Right now, it's been kind of lax and easy because uh, of this kind of crash course thing where I'm not really asking a lot from you in terms of readings and things like that. But pretty soon, we're going to be moving at an, a pretty quick clip. Um, we've got a lot of material to get through um, with these other units, and we're just going to be kind of like bam, bam, bam. So this uh, may not have felt like a 300-level class so far, but it will definitely get there um, once we get done with this week and we get into our first topic in business ethics next week with fiduciary duties. Um, but there was one reply to uh, the Kant discussion board thread about questions cl for clarification about Kant. And so I'll start the video tonight with addressing that. So um, there is a question asked about white lies, that we tell little white lies um, on a regular basis, pretty common human phenomenon. And sometimes those white lies are well-intentioned so they're for um, they're for some good end they're not necessarily um, manipulative in a uh, exploitive sense um, or in some kind of underhanded purpose or just self-serving um, or something like that and so we have to think about this very carefully I think to get like what would Kant say about these sorts of things uh, especially because he says some pretty harsh extreme things about lying in particular of all the kinds of immoral acts that um, are sort of the classic ones that get a lot of attention lying is the one that Kant seems to have a special place reserved for looking at his writings kind of overall um, in some ways he sort of sees lying as the cardinal sin if you will kind of like the most um, paradigmatic example of an immoral action and it's interesting, I think he's, okay, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll say this first. Personally, as someone who's studied Kant's theory and finds it to be, to have some authority to it and it's somewhat persuasive to me, I, I think a lot of Kant's arguments for his theoretical principles are well-grounded and certainly have um, a legitimate role to play in informing our moral reasoning. Even if I'm not like, don't go full on Kant program 100%. Um, that seems to me, uh, I, I am sympathetic with Kant's general program, um, but personally I think Kant totally overshoots uh, what his theory is capable of saying in given his attitude about lying. Kant says lying is never okay for any reason ever, period. 
And he takes a very hard stance about this. And he's been raked over the coals for this so many times. Like, the, the classic scenario that always gets brought up is Nazi Germany. Um, you're hiding Jews in your attic. The Nazis bang on your front door. And they're like, got any Jews in your house? And they don't let you dodge the question or anything. Like, you have to answer the question, what do you do? Like, and it seems by a lot of our intuitions that the right thing to do would be to lie. And Kant says he can't. Now, Kant was way before Nazi Germany, so the, the setting is anachronistic. But if you took the comments that Kant says and apply them into that scenario, that's the result that you get. Um, and I think that's not right. And I don't think that it necessarily is required by Kant's theory. So like I was saying in my Kant lectures last week, sometimes you know Kant offers up this moral theory, and he doesn't always um, make comments or... Um, his attempts at like cashing out what the theory is going to require don't always match. Do you remember I talked about uh, Kant gives four really famous illustrations of the categorical imperative, and two of them I think are totally crap. Like they're terrible examples of the categorical imperative in practice. That I think he misunderstands his own theory when he does that. So there's certainly room for this. Um, so my my kind of stance is Kant is wrong that lying is always wrong, but that doesn't mean that his theory is in jeopardy. But let's talk a little bit, um, I, I'm, I'm happy this question is up, but I'm going to take a little bit of time on it because I think it's helpful for understanding a lot of other things, clarifying a lot of other things about Kant's moral perspective. So it's, it's a very, very good question um, and worth taking some time in. Um, why would Kant maybe be tempted to say that though? You know, why would he think lying is always wrong? Well, um, first let's take up this thread. Kant says, um, behaviors get their moral worth, the actions we perform, get their moral worth, not from their consequences, not from like the direct features like physically of taking that course of action, but the morality of the action depends on the reason why it was done. And uh, because of the second proposition of morality, for an action to have moral worth, it has to be done from reason, and then it has to be done from the categorical imperative as like the ultimate justifying principle that everything else hangs on. So if I'm like, I want to do this action because of this, because of this, because of this, eventually that's got to get grounded on the categorical imperative if the action is going to have moral worth to it. So there's a question. Is there a way that the categorical imperative could license lying? And what would be the main concern here about lying? Um, well, think back to the third formulation of the categorical imperative. Kant's really concerned. He thinks it's a, it's a necessary rule that you have to treat people as ends in themselves instead of treating them simply as a means for some other end. Okay, so um, it's not uh, it's not appropriate to use people as tools, even for some kind of uh, beneficent purpose. So even if it's to like make the most people happy or something, um, you can't use people as a means to some other end. That's why Kantianism is categorically against things like slavery, even if slavery could maximize utility, or even if um, it would um, be good for the slaves or something like that. Kant would say you cannot use people like tools in this sort of way. Um, so that's a big thing to keep in mind here with lying. And the second thing is about the universalizing without contradiction. So think back to that scenario about the lying promise, right? That if it was okay to give lying promises then um, for, for bank loans, then no bank would ever give out any loans, right? So it seems like promise making and promise keeping only has meaning and value in as much as that's being respected as the rule. Now, and this is the part that I add to Kant, and, and I don't think it's that... Um, heretical for me to say this, I think Kant sometimes overlooks how the principles that he, uh, that we might want to universalize can have hypothetical conditions put onto them. That we could say, you know, here's a rule about a contingent good, and saying that it kind of depends on something, that could be universalized without contradiction. So in other words, you could have a rule that says, like, generally you need to keep your promises and not lie to people, um, but, um, while admitting of some exception cases, and as long as those exception cases aren't significant enough or widespread enough, it doesn't ruin the whole game of promise making or um, honesty, like that we trust each other when people when we say what we believe or what we're going to do or, or what's going on there. 
Um, so if lying was going to be justified, it couldn't be for, say, like a very common version of white lies are um, to make people happy. So you like you tell someone that they did a great job after like a really bad theater performance or something like that. Like this happened. I was friends with a lot of theater majors in college, so um, I'm very familiar with that scene. And like you want to be supportive to a person. Um, so, you, you know, you might hold your tongue on some stuff, right? Or tell them that they did a great job when eh, they didn't really do a good job. The reason why Kant's worried about that is that it's basically manipulating people to achieve a result, even a beneficent one, and that's not justified. You're using a person as sort of a means for their own happiness, and that's not to respect them as an end in themselves. To respect them as an end in themselves, remember for Kant, it's got this idea of intrinsic value, but it also has this thing about the basis on which we get our value and moral dignity comes from being self-determining. When I lie to you, or um, when I make a false promise or something like that, I'm taking away your ability to be self-determining. If I am, um, I'm, it's kind of like I'm making your decision for you, right? So uh, let's go to this like theater example. Um, if someone, uh, like a, a person who does a performance has some choices to make about how they're going to orient toward their performance, like um, how are they going to handle whether they did a good job or a bad job? That's a space and sphere of agency. Um, if I don't give you information that's relevant to that, um, if I withhold it or obscure it or give you the false idea of it, then I'm really undercutting your ability to make that choice in a way that's fully informed. Without being informed, then you can't um, make intentional decisions. We talk about this all the time when it comes to um, medical decision making uh, in biomedical ethics and a respect for people's autonomy. Like a doctor who doesn't inform their patients about what happens with different medical procedures or what are the risks or what are the possible consequences or something like that is violating their autonomy, the autonomy of the patient because they're not in a position to be able to make a true authentic choice if they're not informed about that choice. And that's why Kant thinks that lying is problematic, that it starts to undercut people's agency and giving someone the dignity of having choices to make with regard to their own situation and what they have responsibility for. So um, white lies for the purpose of making people happy or giving them right feelings or something like that, positive feelings, that wouldn't be justified for Kant. Um, and we've got a little story here for why. And I, and I don't think that Kant is necessarily talking in a very strange way here, that um, the analysis he's sort of giving here of the moral risks uh, connects with other things that we find intuitively compelling when it comes to moral matters and how to evaluate them. Um, but there's another question of like, um, when could lies actually serve to help empower people, that's another kind of question. Um, I mentioned before addiction as like an interesting sphere for, for Kantian analysis because normally you would want to um, you know, let someone make their own decisions, to use interventionary force on them to control their will would normally violate the categorical imperative because that's not a way of respecting their dignity of being self-determining. But if someone isn't able to do that, if they're like a child or like an addict, then letting them do what they want is not really respecting their dignity and being self-determining. Um, instead, what so there's there's room here. I mentioned in the in the lecture before that there could be room for interventionary force, like like staging an intervention for a uh, for an addict, or slapping the beer out of their hand, you know, if they're an alcoholic, something like that or for um, parents like forcing their children to do certain things, as long as, and this is the really important caveat, those actions are justified only if they serve to put the person in a position where they can be self-determining in the future. So in other words, use of some kind of coercive force or interventionary force can only be justified for Kant if it leads to empowering the person to be able to be a self-determining agent. And that's like if you if you had a Kant on parenting or something like that, it would be like um, 
like a lot of parents, want their children to be functional, independent, autonomous adults. Um, but building that is not something that necessarily happens uh, completely naturally. Just letting the kid do whatever they want all the time doesn't teach them anything about um, subjecting their own will to some kind of intentional rules for their own conduct, to act intentionally or with accountability, kind of the way that Kant is describing agency. Um, that might require some special training. Um, but it's not purely paternalistic. It, it can't ever be for Kant. That would violate the categorical imperative of just saying like, well, you can't make decisions for yourself, so I'm going to make the decisions for you, is not what Kant is proposing here. Um, so it would have to take a very special circumstance in which lying, basically n taking away a person's ability to be an agent, is actually in some way promoting their ability to be self-determining. That could be tricky. That could be really tricky. Um, it might be something like this. Like I could imagine this kind of logic, and we might have to be careful to make sure we're not rationalizing here. Let's say you do create a white lie um, in order to try to uh, help another person's emotional state. So it's got all that. Now that on its own wouldn't be justified on the categorical imperative. Like this, do this for the sake of this. If that's where the story ends, Kant won't be down for it. But what if the emotions that we're seeking to avoid are the sorts of emotions that were they to manifest in the person, the person would be so flooded with that emotion that they wouldn't be capable of making an intentional decision or are really thinking about what actions come from their values, from the categorical imperative, from the moral duty, um, that could be a problem. Then maybe it would be appropriate to sort of um, engage in some deception that creates that kind of outcome. Um, but that would be a very attenuated justification. I, I think it... Um, that quickly could be used as an excuse because notice how it depends so much on the judgment that the person would not be capable of being an agent in that circumstance that's really hard to tell like Kant said like it's very hard for us to make judgments about uh, the extent of our agency and how deep it can go and Kant does have this kind of theoretically optimistic picture that no matter how strong your emotions are a recognition of what is good and what is right can trump all of that it can kind of override all of those feelings. Um, so, Hong Mei, I, I, maybe this is a pretty long-winded answer to your question, but uh, you're the one who asked the question. Am I kind of satisfying uh, what you were wondering about? I'm, I'm curious if, and whether this is making sense. Um, is it going good? I'm digging into some pretty complex territory, and if I was in the classroom, I'd be like looking at people's faces and being like, do I look? Do I see faces of recognition or people being like? Meh. But I, I don't get that on this online thing, so I have nothing to gauge, gauge it off of. Super helpful. That's good to hear. I, I think you know maybe this will just be Tim Linneman's version of Kantian ethics, but so you know maybe it's wrong for me to attribute this to Kant. But I think inspired by his theory. The quick answer I'd offer is that, for Kant, the morality always depends on why something is done. So it's the intentions behind it that do matter. Um, but those intentions are held to a pretty strict standard. Um, just that you want to do good is not enough for Kant. Um, not on its own. It ultimately has to be grounded on this either this thing about not contradicting yourself when you universalize your maxim, uh, or this idea about respect for people treating them as ends in themselves instead of simply as a means. Um, and those are pretty hard limits here. Um, there, there's a, um, by Kant sort of saying the ultimate point of morality isn't happiness, that does undercut a lot of the very common rationalizations for behaviors that are otherwise morally problematic. Um, like we saw the concerns about utilitarianism, but also just anyone who's ever heard that phrase uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. When you start thinking about the consequences and you're thinking about that only, then it can become really easy to rationalize all sorts of, of um, destructive behavior. But Kant's way of approaching the moral standards for the intentions behind our actions kind of um, requires us to think about things in a bigger picture way to make sure that we're making contingent or uh, consistent 
uh, judgments across contingent circumstances so that we we are less in danger, I would say, under Kant's theory of making these ad hoc exception cases to moral rules that could backfire really, really badly. Um, when I want to do anything for Kant, I need to be thinking about all of these contingencies and whether the pattern of reasoning that I'm using can be asserted consistently without contradiction across all of those cases. Um, Sometimes if we're only, I think Kant would say, I, I feel much more confident being like, this is something Kant would say. If we're letting consequences drive the moral car, if those are the main things that we're looking to for account, moral accountability, then we're going to end up in territory we don't want to be in really fast. Again, Kant's looking for some really hard limits to the road, right? Some really firm constraining elements for what could or could not be moral action and something that's not as uh, subject to the whims of circumstances or our own feelings uh, or things of that nature. Um, so anyone who's in the chat room, um, before we uh, leave Kant behind, last chance to dance, anything else you want to ask about Kant? Cool. Moving forward, um, we will, I mean, I, all these moral theories are going to be very relevant for all the material we're going to be doing later on. But I'd say probably the biggest ones that we're, are going to be takeaways from Kant are, one, this idea of treating people as ends in themselves instead of as means. That's huge. And also Kant's priority on freedom is very big too. Um, freedom and autonomy. That these are non-negotiable moral values is definitely uh, a perspective that you see in a lot of um, from a lot of people's moral perspectives it informs a lot of people's um, moral judgments so you'll see those kinds of arguments showing up time and time again um, and then also we will especially when we get into um, the topic on international business where we'll revisit moral relativism um, those concerns about whether morality is built out of anything contingent which I actually saw a lot of this in the journals from this week uh, or from the first week, um, I've been, so like the ones that were due a week ago from last Friday, um, I saw a lot of people kind of thinking that way about morality, that, um, you know, moral values just depend on the culture you're raised in, stuff like that, um, so the idea of universal values is uh, just too much to swallow, like that's not plausible, and a lot of, uh, of the arguments in favor of a universal morality, um, a lot of them trace back to Kant's attempt, um, because if Kant's right, all the things that he's sort of grounding his moral theory on are not things that are contingent from person to person. Like we were saying, Kant's making a morality not just for all humans, but for like any sentient creature. So dolphins, aliens, humans, the whole thing. Um, so if there's, there, the it's not just Kant's... The, um, moral law itself or the content of his moral vision um, it's also the way in which he's trying to justify it and argue for it uh, might be a way to ground this on something that's more solid and that truly is universal and necessary so those are the big things to take away from Kant I think um, and there's all sorts more the moral psychology is really fascinating and we'll see some interesting contrasts between Mill, Kant, and Aristotle that might be some stuff I talk about on Thursday about how they uh, see human psychology in a kind of a different way and that there's a different sort of moral drama taking place based on each of their viewpoints. So I, I think Kant's moral psychology is pretty influential too. This idea of um, different forces that are sort of battling over your will, the laws of inclination and reason justifying your actions um, that and that um, actions that aren't done from reason are not really free, they're not really self-determined. Um, that's that's a that's a big idea. Um, okay. Before we get into Aristotle, um, I wanted to give everyone a brief update. I, I think you deserve an update about the whole internet thing and what's going on with these video lectures. Um, so I um, I'm in the works on trying to get another source of internet in my apartment. Um, I might be able to arrange something with my neighbor. Uh, we have to hammer out some of the details, but I'm going to talk to him about that. Um, also, 
I submitted that work report, I, or I, I don't know if I mentioned this, maybe I didn't. I submitted a work report to the school at Bellevue College to try to help with hooking us up with this Google Plus for Educators thing that would let us have 24 people in the chat room instead of just 10. Um, and uh, that was an issue a little bit back. Ever since we've had technical difficulties, it seems like less people are showing up, which makes me so sad um, that that turned people away, uh, discouraged people from coming. Um, I'd like you to be able to come and be here and participate. We only have four people in the chat, for those of you on YouTube tonight. Um, so, uh, But I do want to open that up so that's an option to have more people attending. Um, I am probably going to go into their office tomorrow and bug them because they've had three business days at this point to get back to me and I haven't heard a response. Um, but the, all the stuff I was getting from Google was saying like, you got to do this stuff with your server and you need rights to the domain for the website and I'd be using Bellevue College's website because it has to be an institution of higher learning, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I need the help from the tech people at Bellevue College to get us hooked in, I think. Um, but they haven't responded yet, but I'll give you... So the update is I don't have any substantial changes other than to let you know stuff is in the works and um, I'm going to try to improve the online experience here for our class this quarter uh, in whatever way I can. So I'm still on that, still working on that, and I'll give you more updates as they come. You're welcome. Um, you deserve it. I, it makes me so sad to have anything that um, discourages this kind of contact and making this as robust as possible because, like I've said before, online, it's uh, it really doesn't feel like the same... I'll just be blunt, the same quality of education as being in the classroom. Uh, that's been my experience as an instructor, and I think a big part of that is about having more contact with your instructor and being able to like talk things over and things like that. Um, so the more of that that I can integrate into the class for its online version, the better, I think. Um, for there to be more opportunities for rapport and asking questions back and forth and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's a big priority to me. So I'm going to keep working on that. Okay. Um, also, uh, yeah, another little business item. Thank you for your patience with me on the journals. Uh, last week was kind of a shit show. I think I mentioned that, um, that I was kind of trying to get them done by Sunday. I, I've got, I think, two more left from that first batch, and then I'll be getting on the second week's, um, and I'll be trying to give replies. One of the reasons why it took so long uh, is because on many of these journals, I wrote a lot of feedback. So I wanted to say a couple things about that to anyone who got, like, a huge wall of text from me. Um, there are a few people I didn't write comments to as well. If you were really disappointed and not see comments from me, always feel free to ask me about that. Tell me, like I was saying before in a previous video, um, I want to get you feedback if you want feedback especially. Um, otherwise, I kind of do it as the spirit moves me and as I've got bandwidth for it. Um, I'll elect to do that too. But I was doing that on a lot of journals. I give a lot of feedback um, for these, especially because it's the first one. And I wanted to kind of contextualize my feedback in a couple of ways. Especially because we don't see each other in person every week. Um, you know, it might, I don't know if I, you know, in terms of personality and relationship and rapport, some some of my comments might feel like they're just coming out of, like, nowhere and um, very, uh, maybe blunt or um, unvarnished, <laughs> um, something like that. A, a couple things I want to say. One, philosophers generally work like this. Um the old adage from English classes when giving feedback about the the sandwich, right? You give like two positive things, like bookending a negative bit of feedback. But with philosophy, we really don't do a lot of that. Um, we really just cut to the stuff where we disagree about stuff, where we get into uh, conflict and controversy. Um, so a lot of times when you're talking with philosophers or looking at papers written back and forth on things, there's not a whole lot of like, I really like what you did this, there, and the other thing. It's more of like, well, what about this thing that doesn't matter? I'm not sure about this thing, right? So we don't do as much of like patting each other on the back about stuff. Um, I do think that is important to good philosophy in the sense of being able to recognize what's of merit and not just what's problematic. But especially when I'm writing really quick feedback for these things, um, I tend to focus, especially on things that I think might be misunderstandings of the readings, I'll tend to focus on that and give critical pushback about things. Because um, I think that's important to clarify those things. But um, I, I really don't um, – the, the the level of critique that goes on in my comments is not to be taken as a message of how well you performed. In fact, less comment might be more of a bad sign. 
if if I have more um, active criticism to offer, that means you did something pretty significant um, and robust that is worth all that kind of discussion and response. Um, um, one of my grad professors always used to say, the worst thing that can happen to you when you publish a paper is not that people start publishing papers that tear apart all of your arguments. The worst thing can, it can happen is that no one writes anything. They just ignore what you wrote. <laughs> They're like, it's not worth the time to engage with or to talk about. Um, so I, I think that's a good little sentiment, um, that criticism is actually a really positive thing here um, rather than uh, a negative thing. Um, definitely, it's not like if you're doing everything right as a philosopher, there should be no critique. I mean, that's that's an, that's a really big illusion about what good philosophical work would look like. Of course, you would like to make a position. You'd love to be able to defend a position in a way where it can defeat all the objections that can be thrown at it or all the opponents that it has to square off against. That's true. But that kind of stuff emerges in the dialogue, in the discussion. If there's no opponents to what you have to say, then you're probably saying something super trivial. Um, that doesn't maybe matter all that much. So um, I wanted to contextualize my feedback a little bit. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say about my comments is that I always kind of write them in a very conversational style. I'm really imagining when I'm, when I'm writing the, these comments, I'm imagining if I was talking to you face to face. Um, if you had just told me all the things that you wrote in your journal in like an oral conversation, um, I, I'd be like, this would be my response. Um, so when I, especially when I say things like, I'm really curious about what you mean by this, uh, or I ask questions and things, those aren't rhetorical. That's not like a passive aggressive way of saying you really should have been more clear or something like that. They are actually sincere invitations for dialogue. I would love to talk to you more about this stuff. It's a frequent way that I close these comments like, if you want to talk more, I'd love to. I say that all the time. You'll probably get sick of me saying that. Um, but I really mean it. Um, the, I, I, I'm not... Um, I'm not writing these comments just sort of sitting up in my ivory tower of philosophy academia like throwing down lightning bolts on my students work I mean that that kind of popping off and shooting things down that's not um, that's not who I am it's not what I want to be I don't, and I don't want that to be the impression either of I don't want that message to get conveyed by what I'm doing um, these are these are all definitely invitational and if I disagree with you about something that's just me joining you in the discussion in the debate um, and I love to continue that. It's not like um, <laughs> I'm not going to respect you or think as highly of you or anything like that. Um, I uh, Giving you my criticism is my, my way of trying to show my respect for your work um, by taking it so seriously. So um, you don't have to respond, of course, um, to my questions or, or invitations, but they're always out there and uh, I'd love to talk more. Like I've been saying, I, I, so far I haven't. I've had almost no phone conversations with anyone in the class. Um, with, there's been a couple exceptions to that, but there really haven't been a lot. Um, there, I haven't seen a lot of, of rapport happen so far in the online class. So, um, you know, look me up. You don't have to wait until something is desperate or weird before we we talk. Um, if you want to put more in this class and just process stuff more, or just have something you want to chat about with me. Um, I'd love to do that with you too, uh, and I've got time for that. Um, there's a lot of a lot of time during the day that I'd be free for a phone call. If you're working and stuff like that, you know, I'd, I'd understand that. That's why we're having these video lectures at night. Um, but uh, let me know what times work for you, and we can make something happen. I'd, I'd love to do that more than what's happening currently. So I've got bandwidth. I want to communicate that. Okay, um, on to Aristotle. So, first thing to say about Aristotle. Um, oh, man, there's so many things to say about uh, Aristotle. Okay, I want to start here, though. Aristotle is going to be playing a really different game than what we've seen from Kant and Mill. Kant and Mill are really concerned with moral duties and obligations. Um, you know, even Mill's theory, which doesn't have absolute rules about behavior, still has the absolute rule about the principle of utility, right? Um, as far as Mill's concerned, whenever you're acting, you have a moral responsibility to maximize utility. That's your job. That's what you are responsible for in every action. And to not do that, to not maximize utility, is to basically um, not fulfill your the what's morally mandatory. Um, I said before that this puts the bar pretty high. 
Um, and I think it, I think it does. Um, it's, it's going to be one of those situations where, uh, it's impossible for you to ever, um, completely exhaust your moral responsibilities. And so you get kind of this moral obligation to keep improving, right? Kind of, uh, endless moral progress. In fact, moral progress itself has been a very interesting theoretical theme in contemporary ethics, um, a lot of moral ideals that people want to set up are things that are superhuman, that are impossible for us to ever perform. I mean, Kant's categorical imperative is impossible to perform. There's no way that we can do that perfectly, much less um, be perfectly responsive in our will to just a concern for what is objectively good and not be waylaid by our inclinations or by our ego or things like that. Um, that's also kind of superhuman for us. Kant's got a pretty cynical view of the self. Uh, and our and our selfishness and self-centeredness and narcissism, um, but at the same time he has hope for that. There is this way in which we can participate in something um, more ideal. Like the space of morality is always available to us. We just don't always take it. Um, that's very optimistic and hopeful on his part. So both of them have these kind of visions of morality, where there's big concerns about um, doing what's right and and not doing what's wrong and you don't quite see that in the same sort of way in Aristotle so um, that's not to say that Aristotle doesn't think that space exists it's just not what he's really focused on um, do you remember before um, do you, I'm asking I'm a, I guess I'm asking chat maybe chat you can tell me if this rings bells you remember my uh, distinction between these three different types of normative judgments we can make. We can make judgments about moral worth, which I was describing as like the moral worth of people, like whether people are deserving of care and concern or not, um, whether what happens to them morally matters or not. That's what we mean by moral worth. And then there was another kind of judgment we could make, um, which I was calling moral status, which is basically like um, <clears throat> whether people are guilty or innocent of wrongdoing. So it's more about like right and wrong actions and moral culpability and moral responsibility. But then there was the, the third category um, that I was just calling virtue because uh, I don't have a, a fancy label for it, theoretically. Um, but it, the space of virtue is just judgments of what's good and bad. That's it. So people could have good or bad characteristics in their personality, in their psyche, in their body. Um, and it's not necessarily something that they're morally responsible for. Like I used the example before, I think of a, a genetic predisposition for alcoholism. If I've got that, that's not a good thing. You know, it's a potentially risky, harmful thing. It'd be better if I didn't have it. But it's not like you would say I'm morally blameworthy for having that trait. That just makes no sense. Um, it's not the kind of thing that I could be held morally responsible for. But we can still talk about whether that trait is a good thing or a bad thing. There's still room for that. So the the whole judgments about good and bad, though the space of that logic, of that world, that conceptual theoretical world, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what you're morally responsible for, whether you're guilty or innocent or anything like that. Or, and then this is very important, it also doesn't necessarily say anything about your moral worth. Even people with bad characteristics can, we could still say, have moral worth. An egalitarian would definitely say that. Mill and Kant would definitely both say that. They, they both think that the value of people is something unconditional. It's not dependent on anything else. For Mill, everyone deserves happiness and deserves it equally. No one's life sort of is supposed to count as being more worthy or not. Like, um, Mill doesn't have some kind of meritocratic system built into whether we need to be concerned about people's happiness. We need to be concerned about everyone's happiness and in kind of with the same basic weight to it. Um, circumstances will change that but because people are affected in different amounts about different things. But in terms of the basic, you might say, right or deservedness of happiness, I like that. Deservedness of care and concern. Everyone's the same. Definitely the same for Kant. That's the third formulation of the categorical imperative. Everyone has intrinsic value. They are, exist as ends in themselves and can never be treated as a means under any circumstances ever. So people have, we have unconditional obligations 
to respect the dignity of people and to promote positively their ability to be self-determining in every set of circumstances. So for Kant, that's pretty strong in terms of people's moral worth being just unassailable, uncontingent. But you can definitely say that some people are more helpful than other people. Some people are causing more problems. Some people have characteristics that are advantages and characteristics that are disadvantages. Um, things that are good and things that are bad. Those things are, those judgments don't have to have anything to do with each other. Um, people, like I was saying when I presented this, this setup before, you can link these things if you wanted to, but um, you don't have to. And uh, I kind of think maybe Mill and Kant are right here that linking them up doesn't make so much sense. Um, not in a really ham-fisted, one-to-one sort of way. Um, so, in other words, we're not going to be elitists about people's moral value based on their moral status, whether they are guilty or innocent of wrongdoing, or about the usefulness of their traits, whether they have good or bad characteristics. Now, Aristotle is completely playing only in the world of what are good and bad characteristics. That's it. Nothing about his theory is attempting to address moral culpability or issues of justice taken in a more robust way of what we ought to be doing, what our moral obligations are, and whether we fulfilled those obligations or not. Um, not interested in that. And he's not interested very much in people's um, moral worth. Not that he's insensitive to these matters or, or doesn't treat them as um, anything... Um, meaningful but it's just his theory is not addressing them and and actually I should be I should speak a little carefully here I'm not a super Aristotle expert like I'm I'm not a specialist in Aristotle I have a couple of friends who are and but from my exposure and I could definitely be wrong about this so take this with a grain of salt but I definitely have seen some signs that Aristotle is maybe not that concerned about justice or isn't concerned about, it might be an elitist about people's moral worth and stuff like that. I definitely see some signs about that. But even if that was true, even if um, Aristotle's kind of arrogant uh, about some of these judgments about people's moral status or about their moral worth, um, that isn't a part of the theory that we're going to be talking about. So there's nothing about the, the theory of Aristotle's virtue ethics that sort of logically or rationally leads to this kind of arrogance or judgmentalism. Um, that's a, that, I, I mention all this because from teaching Aristotle, I'm familiar with him getting this sort of reaction by students, that he looks like someone who's like kind of judging other people and then deciding how much he cares about them um, based on how awesome they are how, or how excellent they are. We will talk about that uh, going forward here. Um, so I, I want to impress that on, on our understanding of Aristotle and on your understanding of Aristotle. Um, I don't think that the theory sort of requires that. All Aristotle is setting up as a theoretical ambition for himself in this work is he's like, it's plain that some things in life are better and worse. What's the good life for a person? What's, what's an ideal human life look like? What's the best that we could hope for? Uh, if we don't get that, it might not be that we're at fault or something for failing to achieve the best possible life or something like that. Um, that's not necessarily a judgment we're going to draw from that. It's And, and Aristotle is going to say it's going to take a little luck um, to actually be, um, <clears throat> to have this ideal human life. Um, you're going to have to have the world cooperate, and the, the world might not cooperate. And it's just bad luck. And it's like, sorry, you're not an excellent person. You're not living the excellent life. It's not your fault. Um, but, you know, things just didn't work out. But he thinks it's still important to think about what would that ideal life look like. Because in as much as we can do something about it, in as much as we have some control or we can offset or hedge our reliance on luck, then we need to know what to shoot for. What's sort of the objective. Another way I like to put it is this. Let's say, um, uh, take, take another sort of scenario. Let's say some tragedy befalls a person. Like, um, uh, let's say their house burns to the ground and they lose all their possessions and 
all their life, like all this kind of meaningful stuff, maybe um, artwork that they've created, you know, all this kind of stuff, family photos, everything. Um, <clears throat> if we were to evaluate that situation and say, well, why are you so sad? You didn't have control. This fire wasn't your fault. Like, let's say it was really a, a freak accident, like a lightning storm or something causes uh, the house to catch on fire. <clears throat> Nothing you could have done about this. You couldn't have stopped it. So you shouldn't feel bad about it because you're not morally at fault. You're you're guilt free. You know, there's nothing you did that was immoral. So why should you feel bad? That would feel pretty insensitive, right? Like there's a world of value that's independent of just the space of moral responsibilities. Um, and even if the person has, let's say we're talking now about the person's life and their person, to say that there's some bad things going on there is not any way like an insult to them or maybe even a consideration of how they don't have moral worth or something like that. If anything, knowing that there's something bad going on in their life might be pretty relevant if I think they are deserving of care and concern, as in they do have moral worth. Otherwise, I'll just kind of maybe ignore what's happening with them and not see that tragedy for what it is. So um, the the idea that Aristotle's pursuing here, his his um, theoretical ambition here is not without merit. I mean, even if we have a theory of moral obligation, like we get from Mill and from Kant, we still need to have another theory, like another component here of figuring out what would be the best possible life. Now, to be sure, Mill and Kant paint a picture of what the good life is for a person. Mill, it's pretty straightforward. What is the best life a person can hope for? Utility, a life full of utility and the best utilities, right? The highest quality utilities, getting their preferences satisfied uh, in diverse and overwhelming ways. I mean, that's like getting everything that you want kind of thing. That's the dream. And that might be different for different people. And utilitarianism embraces all of that as the sort of human ideal. Um, for Kant, the, the really the picture we get of the good life is one of agency and freedom being able to uh, control your will. And I, I'd, I'd say also for Kant, there's this kind of um, really deep vision of human relationship, about how we enact, interact with each other in a respectful way that really acknowledges the value that other people have. I was connecting the dots between Kant's attitude about uh, moral morals and moral duties and his attitude about love and I really think those things are pretty pretty close. If they're not exactly the same thing for Kant, I don't think they're that far away once you've got the third formulation of the categorical imperative. Um, that might be a little bit more of Tim Linneman, because I'm big on love in my own moral theory, so I might be reading something into Kant. But I definitely see the opportunities for reading in something to Kant there. So um, so we get some, some good pictures from them about this too, but Aristotle's going to take it in a different route. Um, he has another way of trying to cash out um, what is a good life for a human look like? Uh, but that's his project. Okay, so let I want to be super clear about that in leading into Aristotle here. He's not judging people for moral accountability. That's not the theme that we're pursuing. And we're not judging people based on whether they're deserving of care and concern. Okay, we just want to figure out what, what's the good life? What's the ideal life for human beings? And just like with Cotton Mill, there is a concern here about whether cultural bias is going to influence things for Aristotle um, and having an account that's truly universal. We'll see how he tries to deal with those problems. Of the three, though, I would definitely say that uh, Aristotle is the one that's happier to lean on common sense, intuition, and even makes cultural references all the time in his writings. He's like, it's kind of like name dropping um, things from like contemporary culture as a part of doing your philosophy. Uh, he does that for his own time and place. He's quoting Homer all the time and stuff like that. Um, and even folk sayings and songs and, and poems and things like that. So um, I think we do have to be a little careful with Aristotle and seeing whether his arguments uh, really hold up. Um, remember, Kant and Mill are both pretty anti-intuitionist. They want to have more solid footing for their moral theory. But Aristotle's got kind of more of this, and this is kind of his general philosophical strategy. He's always like, why make things more complicated than they have to be? Start with common sense. When that starts going wrong, then you can start thinking about making things more sophisticated. And that's exactly how he goes here. Um, when he starts talking about this 
excellent life, what's the what's the best possible idealistic life for a human, um, he starts the discussion by just being like, well, what do people say? You know, person on the street, what do you say? And he's like, these are the things I hear. These are the things that people are talking about. Let's take a look at those. Oh, they're serving to be a little inadequate. Well, maybe we can fix them. There's some better option here for how we can approach this. So Aristotle is giving a kind of vision that in some ways I, w I would say is a little countercultural to his time and place um, historically. Um, but he always is kind of, he always is willing to start, to get the ball rolling with kind of how we ordinarily think about things. Which is kind of the second thing I wanted to say about Aristotle going into him here. Um, there is going to be very quickly a focus here on character. And that's why this is called the virtue ethic. Um, if you heard words like virtue and vices. These are like personality quirks, um, motivations, um, psychological elements. Um, your kind of your psych psychological profile is like a way to think about character here. Uh, and you can have good traits and bad traits. Um, you can have tendencies for uh, things that are good, like honesty, courage. Um, being a good friend is a huge thing for Aristotle. Um, and um, good-natured, he talks about greatness of soul, um, kind of uh, people who are able to get along with others and be interesting and that kind of stuff. Um, and people are prudent, people who, uh, all, the, all these different good traits, idealistic traits of a person. And then there's tons of vices too, uh, gluttony, greed, um, dishonesty, um, narcissism, like all these sorts of traits that are uh, anger management issues would be a vice. You know, they're they're traits that people can have that are that are not ideal. They're they're not good things about a person if they have them. Um, sometimes traits can be sort of helpful in one way and harmful in another way. Um, there's definitely some room for subtlety about that too. Uh, we'll see more of Aristotle's picture here as we keep going. But Aristotle is going to be moving <clears throat> from very quickly from. Um, what is an excellent life for a person into how do we need to be to live that? And in many ways, those things kind of become coextensive questions. I mean, for Aristotle, um, the excellent life is being an excellent person. And uh, the person who is capable of uh, engaging with life in this really idealistic, excellent way. So we'll talk about what all that stuff means. But the thing I wanted to say right now is, as a special note is that Aristotle doesn't have a monopoly on virtue ethics. In my opinion, as an ethicist, I always like to argue that every moral theory needs a virtue ethic, in as much as if you have a moral ideal like the principle of utility or the categorical imperative or something like that. Once you've got that ideal defined, you need to start addressing like, what do we need to be like to live that ideal, rather than it just being a conceptual theory but how does it actually become manifest? How do we manifest it? What are the traits that we need to have that are going to help us meet that goal? If we were talking about the moral progress thing of like, how do I get closer to that moral ideal? What sort of things do I need to be working on in myself to be able to do that better? In many ways, virtue ethics is the world of self-help. So a lot of self-help books, if they have any philosophy, some of them are just full of bullshit. But in as much as they have any kind of like, wisdom or philosophical content to it, it's usually a contribution to this discussion around virtue ethics, about what would be good to be like. And especially in the business world, you hear about this stuff constantly. And there's a way in which it's very, very consistent with Aristotle's model. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but there's also ways in which Aristotle would think a lot of this kind of self-help business world kind of crap is pretty petty but um, and not very excellent. But we'll, we'll talk about that too. But if you think about it, Mill and Kant are both going to need a virtue ethic too. And we've talked about, we've touched on this a little bit. If the whole point of morality is to maximize utility, what do we need to be like to be able to do that well? Well, you're going to need to have traits like um, definitely a willingness to sacrifice your own happiness when the situation calls for it, which is a big thing to do. Like it's hard for us to do that. That's a, that's a character trait that might require some training. Um, empathy is a really big one. Having a lot of wisdom and understanding about other circumstances, a pretty active imagination for, for like understanding possible consequences, um, 
just having the wherewithal to be able to hold this stuff in balance and get a feel for it. Uh, we talked when it came to judgments of quality, like having that kind of sensitivity, a lot of both being very informed about stuff, we're having a lot of experiences, but also being able to be sensitive to like picking up on the affordances for something being pleasurable or painful. That's pretty important too. So <clears throat> there's going to be uh, a what a ideal utilitarian person would look like is basically the character traits that would enable someone to have their best shot at being able to maximize utility. Uh, other things that would fall in this category, do you remember when you talked about um, me kidnapping students, torturing them in my basement? And I said at some point, you know, if I have any choices about changing my character, about what I'm going to desire and take pleasure in, I have utilitarian reasons to try to, you know, eliminate my desire of sadistic pleasure and replace it with something like taking pleasure in the happiness of others. That would really help um, maximize utility if I could make that character change in myself. So that's virtue. Even for Kant, who's like all about reason and doesn't want to ground morality at all in our psychology, in the like inclinations and character traits. In one way you could say uh, Kant has like a negative virtue ethic. Like basically um, we should be striving for like Buddhist enlightenment and detachment from our ego, detachment from our desires, things like that, in order to uh, be able to fulfill the categorical imperative, to be able to stay focused on doing our moral duty. Buddha, actually, a lot of the way Buddhism describes moral action and the ideal for it sounds so much to Kant like me, and they've got a lot more discussion about character than Kant does, about like taking seriously how would we realize this moral theoretical ideal. Um, so I've found a lot of success in kind of marrying, uh, adding some Buddhism into Kant's theory as a way to give us some guidance for how to become good Kantians, so to speak. Um, so it might have like a negative virtue, but also I think things like, um, certainly uh, analytic ability is going to help here, but in intellectual imagination, like what I talked about is Kantian empathy is going to be pretty big, and really emotional intelligence. That was something else I emphasized in my lecture. I think to be a good Kantian, you have to have a lot of emotional uh, intelligence and awareness and sensitivity in order to see where there are those opportunities for inclinations to hijack the will and to, and to find a way to rationally orient toward them. Um, and maybe even to see how the emotions might um, rationally inform the action as well, because uh, there's space for that under Kant, I think, too. If you remember the punching the pillow kind of scenario I described with my brother. Okay, so... Aristotle doesn't have a monopoly on virtue, but contrary to Kant and Mill and other types of moral theories, for Aristotle, virtue is the big thing. It's the thing at the top. Okay, so the other ones will be concerned about virtue, but Aristotle is going to kind of make it into the end game too, as kind of the whole purpose. So we'll talk about this. Um, what? How is he going to approach this? How does he want to argue for it? What is he going to base it on in terms of justification? We'll get into all that very shortly here. But I want to check in with the chat. How are things going? No one's interrupted me so far with questions. Um, how has it been how's it been going? Anything popping up? Wow, cool. Okay. Every time I ask there's no questions. Um, I don't know, maybe I, I I very much hesitate on the hypothesis that I'm such a good lecturer that there are no questions. Um, but, but yeah. Maybe? Maybe? Any areas of curiosity so far? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. I have to process first and come up with questions. Yeah, that's absolutely fair. Okay. Well, we're coming up on an hour here. Um, people in the chat, what do you think about taking like a short break? Maybe chew on some stuff and when we come back, maybe see if there are any questions that pop up. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, then I'll pause the video here and those of you on YouTube, there'll be like no time at all. Maybe you can pause it and think if you have any questions. Yeah, you. Okay. 
Okay, I just mentioned this to everyone in the chat room, but um, for all of those of you on YouTube, I can make this announcement now to everybody. Uh, while I was just taking that short break, I finalized things up with this plan with my housemate and or my flatmate uh, apartment building we're in. And uh, I'm currently hooked up on his Wi-Fi now, and it sounds like the video quality is so much better, and we shouldn't have any more problems with people dropping and all that kinds of things. So uh, that should be a long-term solution for the rest of the quarter, and I'm so happy to be able to report that and to uh, be able to improve the experience here for everybody. So <sighs> that makes me feel awesome. Okay, so... Uh, People in the chat, any uh, any questions kind of popping up when you were kind of ruminating on things over the little break? With all this kind of setup for Aristotle. Okay, so it uh, looks like um, no real questions popped up just yet, but as always, you can check in with me later and um, at, or after the video or after the whole lecture or anything like that. Okay, so um, to really get into how Aristotle wants to proceed here, um, probably the core principle that um, Aristotle is using to kind of approach this whole matter of what is a good person and what is a good life? Um, like, how does he start to get like a handle on it theoretically? It comes from something Aristotle says about goodness itself, and this is a so this is if there's a kind of like a core theoretical axiom for Aristotle, I think this is it. Aristotle is kind of like a functionalist. He says, good is not a property that things just have. It's not like goodness is a thing. Um, uh, like something could be red or fast or something like this. Um, goodness itself isn't isn't a um, uncontextualized uh, property or phenomenon. Aristotle always he says if you're going to say anything is good, you have to ask the question: Good for what? And the purpose of something or the end towards which it is directed will give you insight about how to tell whether something is a good thing of its kind. And that's another really interesting thing about Aristotle is that goodness is not this sort of universal thing. It's dependent on the kind of thing being evaluated. So uh, let's use some like really simple examples. Um, how about my cup here? This is an awesome cup. It's a very good cup because it's a Portland Trailblazers cup. Um, rest in peace, Trailblazers. Oh, you! That was so sad and disappointing. Uh, they just lost really terribly in the playoffs. But let's talk about it apart from its uh, wonderful qualities of um, be, having Portland Trailblazers all over it. Um, this cup is a good cup. Why is it a good cup? Well, it's performing its function admirably. What a cup is good for is containing things like liquids um, without having them spill and leak all over the place. And it's doing a pretty darn good job of that. Like, that's a thing that I need things to be done, and the, this cup is doing a really good job of that. A cup that was shaped like this would not be a very good cup, because um, it wouldn't be able to perform that function well. Or, uh, usually in, when I give this lecture, I talk about tables. Tables are always a classic, ordinary, inane sort of object. But this table that my computer is resting on right now, it's a good table. Why? How do I tell that? Well, because it's performing its function admirably or excellently. Um, a good table, the, what's the purpose of a table? To hold stuff up in a way that is uh, available for convenient access. So a table that's like one inch tall, even if it's stable, uh, is probably not a good table. Um, or a table that's like at the right height, but is kind of like warped like this, or has rickety table legs where things get bumped and jostled all the time, bad table. If you've ever been to the cafeteria in the uh, at Bellevue College, they've got a lot of bad tables in the cafeteria because 
they always like jostle at the worst time and spill coffee all over yourself and if you're me um because <laughs> the table legs are not they're not set up right for that to happen okay so we can sort of uh, maybe accept that axiom from Aristotle that if we're going to say something is good, it's always good for something. And we'll talk about that something that it's good for as its end or its purpose or its function. So when Aristotle starts coming to people, he's like, well, okay, if we're talking about people, then we're wondering kind of like what's the purpose of a person. And for a lot of things, uh, those purposes are really contingent. Um, for example, if we want to figure out uh, if someone is a good carpenter, we could figure that out by knowing what's the purpose of carpentry. And the purpose of carpentry would be, among other things, to make good tables. And we figure out what good tables are based on the purpose for a table and so on and so forth. But people are more than just carpenters or teachers or accountants or whatever it is that is a kind of particular skill or role that you play. So Aristotle says a good person is going to be context-less. That is something universal to everything that humanity has to offer. Um, so the, the kind of the core axiom here is good defined by function. And a human being is a multifunctional object. We're much more functional than tables. So the concept of the good for a person is going to be much more complicated. It's going to be much more robust than what it is for a good table. But it's very important here to note that for Aristotle, being a person is being a human. Not that there aren't other people, like if dolphins might be people in like the Kantian sense, or alien, sentient aliens might be people in the Kantian sense. But Aristotle's not interested in giving a universal ethic or a virtue ethic for every type of being anywhere that could possibly exist. He's not thinking on that level that Kant is uh, about moral goodness in relating to having a good will. That's why Kant gets into the more abstract universal stuff, because he's really focused on the will and moral responsibilities and obligations, um, a feature that arguably we would share with dolphins or sentient aliens, things like that. For Aristotle, he's really focused on the contingencies, and he's really happy about that. Uh, he doesn't think there's a problem with that. All we, The real question of living a good life, I'm like, I'm not a dolphin. I don't have to be good at echolocation the way that dolphins need to be to be good dolphins. That's a part of their functioning. It's not a part of the human function. So what is good for a person is different from what's good for a dolphin or good for a dog or good for a chair or good for a sentient alien. It's going to be really uh, informed by the context of what it is to be a human. Um, so that's why uh, a lot of contemporary discussions around Aristotle are like, you know, how do we maybe change our vision of what a person is or could be? Like when we think about, uh, there's been all this sort of recent work in virtue ethics around transhumanism. Like if we use technology to start augmenting our bodies and our minds, we might really change human functioning beyond what we naturally and biologically have. Um, and, and that would maybe change the game for Aristotle. I won't dig too far into that tangent, but... It's a good illustration of how the reason why modern Aristotelians and virtue ethicists are thinking about that is because Aristotle is setting it up this way for a virtue ethic. A good person is going to be defined by a person performing the functions of a human in an excellent sort of way. Okay, now there's something else I wanted to touch on that's a little bit of a scholastic point. I'm not going to make too big of a deal of this, but if any of you were doing some of the reading from the Nicomachean Ethics, you'll notice the translation that's used translates uh, excellence a lot as happiness. And I want to comment on that. And that has been a traditional translation device for a long time. But the Greek word that, um, that Aristotle is using is eudaimon, uh, eudaimon person, or eudaimonia, if we want to consider it in that kind of abstracted way. And eudaimonia is is basically like saying something is praiseworthy and happiness is loaded with a lot of other baggage maybe closer to something like utilitarianism like getting the things that i want or having meaningful things in my life um, or a certain mood or attitude or feeling emotion that i might have we might think of that as happiness that's not what aristotle has in mind when he's asking about what's the happy life or what we translate as the happy life that's not really what he's discussing it's more of what is a good person, and I kind of like this turn of phrase to describe it. Aristotle's wondering, basically, a eudaimon person is just like a well-functioning human. 
a human that isn't malfunctioning, uh, a human that's like performing its functions excellently, that accomplish the goal that those functions are have as their end. Okay, so that's that's a sort of early vision that we're getting here, and there's a bunch of different. Um, pictures of what this end of human life is, what's sort of the purpose or meaning of life. Uh, and this is where Aristotle kind of consults uh, what the person on the street would say. And he says, when you talk to people, they have usually three different sorts of visions of what a excellent life would be, what a um, ideal human life would look like. One of them is a life of pleasure. So experiencing valuable things having valuable experiences. That's one sort of theoretical option here. Another one is the life of action, that you're um, doing, you're, you're making accomplishments, like especially in the business world, like you see this kind of thing in play of like you're a mover and a shaker, you've got influence, you've accomplished big things, your portfolio is looking good, right? You know, your resume and all this kind of stuff. Um, you, you have all this sort of record of your accomplishments. That's kind of like the life of action. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. And then um, the life of understanding and wisdom, the kind of philosophical life, um, which, you know, is definitely has some cultural prominence in Aristotle's day. Socrates and Plato both have been on the scene for a little while now. Aristotle's a student of Plato. And there's lots of, I mean, it's a very active time uh, historically for philosophy and so seeking after wisdom knowledge and understanding that's another kind of way to maybe think about um, an excellent life if it's accomplished that Aristotle uh, dismisses two of these right off the bat um, he kind of leaves the life of the philosopher kind of open until the very end of the Nicomachean ethics and there's actually some fun commentary things about that um, but I will say uh, in the sort of orthodox Aristotle view that I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the lecture today and maybe on Thursday a little bit too um, it's not really the life of the philosopher that he's going to privilege. At the very end of the book, he says that is an excellent life, but um, the theoretical view that we get here is something that's a lot bigger than just being a philosopher, so I'll, I'll talk about that. But the other two options here, the life of pleasure and action, let's say some more about action. Um, I'll try to keep this quick. I, I, maybe I don't need to, to belabor this a whole lot for our crash course purposes, um, but I think it, it's worth remarking that in Aristotle's time, this is really the default cultural answer of his community. Um, he lives in Athens. I don't know how much you know about your ancient Greek history, um, but uh, um, in, Athenians thought they were pretty cool for doing this whole democracy thing. And, and their democracy is not a pure democracy, um, not by any stretch of the imagination, because if you're a foreigner, a slave, a woman, or you're poor, then you're you're not really included. Like you don't have a vote, you don't get to participate civically. You can't be a mover and a shaker. So there's there's a lot of uh, deep inconsistencies here. Um, but for the time period where everyone's being ruled um, in a kind of like feudalistic esque kind of way, or just with kings and monarchs and stuff like that, kind of um, dictatorships, the Athenians thought they were pretty hot shit for like pioneering this kind of progressive new uh, social pattern um, and they think really highly of it and so it's like very deeply embedded in their culture and how they see a uh, successful life and a meaningful life it's all really wrapped around this idea of civic engagement um, so being a mover and a shaker the life of action is is kind of how you live a life that has value and meaning and that you'll be remembered and and for your accomplishments and stuff like that um, so that's what Aristotle is kind of speaking to, and he rejects it. So I said he's a little countercultural, um, and he's got some interesting arguments here. Um, pleasure, but uh, okay, I'm not going to belabor these. I'm going to move on to mostly just I think I think I'm going to make a an uh, I'm going to call an audible here and and kind of deviate from my usual lecture just for the sake of efficiency here and just go on Aristotle's picture. But he's got some arguments for why these theories are inadequate. But here's the big takeaway he incorporates some of what they have to say into his picture. So he's kind of, he's not just doing this, well, what do people say as a way to like, just give himself a layup to like smack down and be like, that's why you need my answers or something like that. I mean, he's, he thinks there's some wisdom in common sense, but it's not seeing the sort of whole picture. So let's take a look at <clears throat> what um, Aristotle does say. 
and I'm going to do some screen sharing here. I'm going to pull on my lecture notes um, so uh, people in the chat here can you can sort of follow along a little bit. Here we go. Um, so this is kind of all the stuff I've been talking up to this point. Um, here in, in book one, section seven, and a little bit in section 10 and 8 here, he builds out this kind of core formula for what it means to be a good human, to live the excellent life, to be eudaimon, to be praiseworthy. Um, one of my favorite uh, contemporary Aristotle scholars translates eudaimonia as if you're a happy person, if you're the excellent person, if you are eudaimon, then you're like an example of human life at its very best. That's what it's like. Um, some of this will have to do with things that are under your power and some of them will not. And that's why I said that this is really just about what's good and bad for people, um, not necessarily a statement about their, their ethical or moral culpability or anything like that. Um, those of you in the chat, are you able to, to see the screen share uh, and it's legible? Yay! Wonderful. Good to hear. Okay. So um, <clears throat> let's start down here with this core formula that I've got boxed. Uh, and let's cash this out. So Aristotle says that to live excellently, you are trying to create the excellent life. That's the main goal. I'll say more about this in a second. But how we get there matters. And the first thing he puts in there is activity of soul. And what does that mean? Aristotle's saying basically for the human good, right? For if you're the human sort of object, you are the kind of being which is capable of acting. You can act. You have an animus. If you remember my um, mentioning of that Greek concept of an animus when I did the Kant lecture, um, humans are capable of originating their own behavior. We are not inanimate objects like tables. We do things. And so you have to be acting if you're an excellent person. I'm going to use some examples to illustrate Aristotle's logic here and, and help us try to get inside of his head. Imagine an excellent painter. Um, and imagine them, well, first let's just imagine a painter who's got mad skills. I mean, they're just a, they've got innate artistic ability. Um, they're a savant. Um, maybe they've also received some good training. Um, but they basically, they, they have vision, um, they have like interesting things to express artistically, and they've got the ability to express them in amazing, amazing ways. So they could create amazing works of art, um, but they never paint any paintings. They've got the ability, but they never use it. And Aristotle would say, that's just not as praiseworthy. That's not an example of human life at its very best, because what would be better if they actually painted the paintings? So just having a skill doesn't really make you excellent for Aristotle. You have to actually act on it. You have to manifest it. And that requires action. And what we mean by activity of soul, by soul it just means the mind. Um, but you have to be doing things um, sort of with your animus, this kind of self-directed stuff. Um, you have to be actively participating. It can't be a passive thing. Being excellent is not a passive ability. You can't rest on your laurels. You have to be demonstrating, you have to be manifesting that, that excellent ability that you have in order for it to be truly excellent. Um, otherwise, it doesn't really count for anything. Um, please, people in the chat, feel free to jump in if you want me to kind of talk over something if I'm going a little fast um, or if you want to ask for clarification here. This is a pretty important part of the lecture, so I want to make sure I'm doing a good job explaining it and you can help me out with that. So that's the first condition. That has to be met. The second condition is this thing about that the action has to be done via reason. And there's a couple really big ideas here um, that Aristotle's trying to emphasize. The first one is that reasoning itself is another part of the human function. And it's not a side function. It's not like carpentry. Um, reasoning is like a basic part of humanity. It's a part of everything that we do. It's a ubiquitous element. Kind of Kant would so totally agree with that and sort of like reason is is part of the structure of human existence um, all parts of human consciousness are related to it it doesn't exhaust everything but it's definitely a universal element and that's one of the reasons why it's getting in here 
just the same way that activity we have to act because that's part of what kind of being we are well we're also a rational thing um, so we need to be performing that function excellently too if we're going to be good good humans eudaimon um, the other real big thing here though that Aristotle has in mind is that the action needs to be intentional I have to be doing it intentionally I have to be directing my activity not haphazardly but with understanding and let me give you a, a kind of a silly example of this um, oh a question um, uh, I'm gonna answer that Hongmei I think after the lecture because uh, I think that might get me on a little tangent here that I, I was this is one of the things I kinda was planning on skipping um, and I, I don't think we need it for the video lecture but if you're curious about that I'd be happy to talk to you about it after we're done here thank you for asking it though um, uh, it's I'm very tempted to try to rope it in but especially with where we're where we're at at this point I, I don't want to kinda cut back to that um, and that's a lot uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of uh, contrasting him with some other views here, especially Plato, which I haven't brought anything up about. Yeah, okay, thanks for understanding. Um, okay, so I'll give you a silly example here of why intentionality matters for Aristotle. Um, have, uh, maybe you've played um, uh, video games where there are these like Street Fighter video games, like fighting video games. Um, where you have like two avatars and they're like having a street brawl and you've got to press buttons in really special combinations to make exciting moves happen that can be really good in the fight and this kind of thing even if you've never played these games before um, you might be able to just have a frame of reference of like um, playing a game where there's some skill involved here um, and or even even a game like chess uh, where um, there's a lot that you could be understanding about the game that you could be informing your choices in the game to be able to be uh, better at it okay so there's room for intentional action here um, but I like the fighting game thing because if you're not good at fighting games like me um, but still enjoy them sometimes play them every once in a while I haven't played them in a long time but I used to play them all the time in college uh, but I was never very good and I do something called button mashing where you just like press buttons as fast as you can kind of randomly and then every once in a while you get lucky and a really cool move gets pulled off so maybe maybe the action that you performed is the excellent action in that it achieves the excellent purpose like it you win the match um, same thing in like maybe I I'm moving my pieces around in a chess game but I don't really know what I'm doing but it just sort of happens to work out really good like I made a brilliant move without realizing it I did do an action which fulfilled the excellent end that performed the sort of end of the the function of this action excellently but I if I didn't do it with understanding that doesn't seem as excellent as if I did it intentionally like if I'm just button mashing and happen to pull off the perfect move at the perfect time and win the match in this fighting game like in Street Fighter um, cool but if I was doing it intentionally like I know the move I know how to execute it and at just the right time I choose I see the moment this is the right moment I do the move I pull it off and I win that seems more excellent than just getting lucky if I know what I'm doing that seems to add excellence to the action um, reason is going to play a pretty pivotal role for Aristotle for a bunch of reasons but this is kind of where the whole story starts um, the intentionality is pretty significant and the fact that rationality is a basic part of the human function that's also pretty significant so that's kind of the story beyond, behind why this gets into the formula here so all this act, activity that I'm doing the actual behavior done intentionally is all directed toward the end of achieving the excellent life and this is a big blank check right here um, and we have we have to talk about that um, that's what this little formula up here in my lecture notes is intended to um, uh, sort of cash out for us um, so right now this is this is a big blank check but I promise you we're gonna cash it in a second okay but before we do that Aristotle later adds a very significant third condition or the fourth condition in the mix here and he he talks about the necessity of the relevant resources to manifest or act the excellence so what this is basically saying is like the activity that I do that I do the reason this is kind of like within my wheelhouse it's what I get to control it's like my contribution to 
uh, creating the excellent life. But in this extra condition, Aristotle's saying, well, the world needs to make a contribution here too. If you're actually going to realize the excellence, you're going to need some help, and there's no way to get around it. Um, there's always some way in which your efforts are vulnerable to what the world's giving you to work with. So let's go back to our painter example. We were saying before for Activity of Soul that the painter that doesn't paint any paintings is not as excellent as the painter who does paint the paintings um, that they're capable of painting. In order to paint paintings, you need paints. You need canvases. That's going to require some resources, some opportunity to be able to manifest that excellence. And no matter how good of a painter are, you are, you can't just pull paints and canvases out of thin air. right? You can't do that. So there's some external conditions that need to be favorable in order for you to be excellent. Now, if we were talking about morality here and like moral responsibility and culpability, this would be a terrible thing to include because it basically makes someone's moral status subject to luck. And that really seems to cut against just what it means to live morally, to act properly. Like Kant was saying, we don't morally evaluate boulders, right? Objects that are, don't have freedom, that don't choose to do things, um, that are subject to just these natural laws, they, there's no morality there. We don't say the boulder is immoral. Um, so the, the whims of fate and what the world has going on and the laws of nature, that's just a, not a moral space. We can't talk about moral responsibility there. But Aristotle's not doing that, remember? He's just talking about what is good, what's ideal. And you could be lucky in being able to realize that ideal, and you could be unlucky. And the only way we could even tell lucky versus unlucky is whether an ideal thing was made or an unideal thing was made. Um, so that's, again, just as a reminder of, of what Aristotle is up to, what he's focusing on here. It's just that idea. So I think this is interesting. Um, Aristotle's sort of acknowledging that a good human life is kind of contingent and fragile. Um, it needs We need some help. Even with something like... Um, the virtues themselves like if if this end goal is really just having these virtuous characteristics even those require resources let's take aristotle's favorite one um friendship like being a good friend he thinks is one of the most important things to being a good person um being a good friend like is yeah i can't underestimate or, or downplay just how big of a deal that is for aristotle he makes a big deal out of it um but Keep in, mind, um, keep in mind this idea. Even if I have it within me to have the skill, right, like the painter, of being able to be a good friend, if I just don't have people in my life that I could be friends with, then I can't realize or manifest my excellence of my capacity for this virtue, for this kind of friendship virtue. I need the resource of just other people around to have relationships with in order to manifest that excellence. And this will go for all the excellences. All of them, at, at some level, require these resources. They, they need a contribution from the world in order to happen. And Aristotle is just acknowledging that by building that into his formula of saying, this isn't just about what you're doing, but it's also about what the world is doing. Now, he is going to uh, kind of modify this slightly um, when we talk about what uh, the excellent life looks like. Um, but but this, is, uh, this is an important... Um, addition uh, and he doesn't he's not going to eliminate this entirely uh, it's definitely going to be re a requirement okay I'm gonna pull up um, Microsoft paint here as a little bit of a whiteboard and I'm gonna screen share that for you in the chat because I'm gonna do some drawing here to talk about the excellent life and what Aristotle has in mind with that but maybe before I do that, I'll check in really quickly again how did my discussion of activity of soul done by a reason, equipped with the relevant resources from the world. How's that going so far? Maybe you're already starting to get some like self-help book vibes off of this. So far so good? Sounds like it's going good. Oh, okay, bummer. Oh, it wasn't because of the internet though, right?
Okay. So, um, so Aristotle's vision of the excellent life. Um, I want to call your attention back to how Aristotle said um, the good for a thing is defined by its function or its purpose. And I, I said that when it when it comes to the people, Aristotle thinks we're multifunctional. And in fact, um, oh here maybe before I go to the whiteboard, I'll talk about this extended metaphor a little bit. Um, so if people are these like multifunctional things, you could kind of think about us like a Swiss Army knife. Like if you're going to have uh, like a Swiss Army knife has like all these different features in it, right? It's got all these different functions that it's capable of. If you were going to have an example of a Swiss Army knife at its very best, then you wouldn't want any of its functions to be kind of substandard, right? It need to have all those things working great. And I have never had a Swiss Army knife that does everything right. Like the screwdriver, the knife, maybe a little saw thing, a scissors, a toothpick, a tweezers, a bottle opener, like all these different things. There's always something in the Swiss Army knife that's like kind of not that functional. Like it doesn't do a super good job. So any of those Swiss Army knives wouldn't be the sort of ideal Swiss Army knife, right? An ideal one would very logically be the one that all the functions are excellent on. And it has a lot of them, right? It can do a lot. It's not a Swiss Army knife with three functions. It's a Swiss Army knife with like 20 functions. You know, that would be even better. Um, and that's how Aristotle thinks about people. People are multifunctional organisms. And to be an excellent person, you got to be good at everything. So maybe you've heard this kind of phrase of like the Renaissance man or the Renaissance person. And this this ideal uh, from from the Renaissance um, was like the well the well-rounded person, the person who's like an accomplished scientist, philosopher, writer, artist, like musician. Um, the religious component in there, maybe psychology, um, a good conversationalist, um, someone who can be a good politician too, like the whole bag, right? Like think liberal arts college experience is kind of like trying to create that ideal person. In fact, Aristotle has always been the kind of touchstone for the justification for a liberal arts education, that it's good to have not just be a specialist. And that's the key idea here. Aristotle does not think an excellent person is someone who's a specialist who's just really good at one thing. You need to be good at all these different spheres of human life, all these things that uh, have roles or functions that are capable of being performed. So that means like our physical health um, and our physical excellence, that's a part of things. Um, but so is things like, um, like our ability to be a good friend or a good parent or a good child. Um, or a good citizen, um, or your, whatever your profession, like good teacher, right? I wear all these different hats, and I need to be good at all of them. And a lot of times we have, like, people that are, like, we might think of as great people, as, like, role models who we look to who are, like, really good at some things. Like, there have been some, like, really accomplished athletes or politicians or or intellectuals, like philosophers, who then are also, then we find out things like, or, or, or artists, artists very much in this category too, then we find out they're like, oh, they're a domestic abuser, or they're an alcoholic, or, you know, there's, there's these other things that they're really dropping the ball on. And that seems to diminish, like, how much we'd say the person is praiseworthy, or an example of human life at its very best. We're like, well, that was so good, but this is so bad. Like, that's kind of how Aristotle's thinking about this. He's going to reserve his praise uh, for anyone who's not, like, doing it all right. Like, he's like, I don't want to water down what this ideal is. And the ideal is a pretty pretty big one. I mean, it's like, um, there's actually a bunch of theoretical discussion around whether being excellent, is there, like, some threshold about this, or do you have to be perfect in everything? Um, I, I don't think we need to resolve those questions. You might be wondering about those. But if you want to take virtue ethics seriously... You don't have to resolve those kinds of stickier questions to see it as something insightful. Kind of like how I was mentioning earlier in this lecture that Mill and Kant set up like superhuman ideals, but we can still use them as a point of reference for doing better or worse. For Aristotle, it definitely matters to not put all your eggs in one basket. But there are all these other facets of life that you can't be dropping the ball on, and that you've got to be doing excellently too. 
So when it comes to the excellent life, Aristotle is thinking it's not going to be just a few things that you're doing well. It's going to be a life full of excellences, as many as possible, that are possible for human beings, because we can't do everything. Can't be good echolocators, right? But we can be doing a lot of other things excellently. And there's kind of an infinite number of functions we could really choose from. Maybe not infinite, but there is just an overwhelming amount of things that humans are capable of doing in terms of being multifunctional devices. I mean, we're we got a lot of potential functions. Um, you might be, you know, kind of maybe at this point, you're, all of you I think are in the accounting program, so you kind of got a like a path that you've been working on. But a lot of times when I'm teaching Aristotle to like um, freshmen and sophomores in my 102 ethics course it's like people are still trying to figure out like what are they going to major in like what do i want to develop myself into being good at there's so many things to choose from here and that's a problem that aristotle respects and he wants to say um he well this the first thing he wants to say is ideally you want to pack that life full with excellence as much as you can get fit but you got to be selective about it you can't do everything but some things matter more to be done than others. There are some excellences that are maybe deserving of being more in the center and other ones that are more out in the periphery. So now, now let me get to my drawing here. Um, because my favorite metaphor for Aristotle's vision, theoretical vision for the excellent life and an excellent person is really a patchwork quilt. So uh, let's go back here. <clears throat> here we go. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's going to look a little bit more like this. And I'm not intending these things to be overlapping so much. Um but if you and they're not really patchwork quilty, but you get the idea here that there are some things that are maybe um more central they're kind of of more, I'm trying to bold this one a little bit, more central importance and other ones that are kind of more secondary, okay? And Aristotle wants to give us some principles to help us decide what things should really be kind of more at the center here um, and which ones are maybe a little bit more on the kind of the periphery. I just realized I can make awesome arrows uh, just like that. <laughs> so... Which ones, uh, basically, think, Aristotle's thinking about this as a practical problem, right? Like, you only have so much life. You only have so much time. You only have so much energy. You only have so much resources. What are you going to spend those on? Which excellences are you going to dedicate yourself to developing and getting really good at? You're going to have to prioritize this stuff. But some stuff is maybe more centralized, more deserving of attention, um, and other stuff less. Your life is a space that's going to get filled up really quick. And you've got part of excellence is being discriminating about which excellences to prioritize developing and which ones to deprioritize. So this picture is really big. Um, and Aristotle thinks a lot of this depends on experience. In fact, Aristotle has it as almost a, another one of his general axioms that if you want to be a good judge of something, like, like being a good carpenter, how do you become a good judge of tables? Well, you have to have experience with tables. And that experience can take different forms. It could be education. You could have a good carpenter pass on their knowledge to you, but their knowledge is ultimately based on experience. Or you could teach yourself. You know, street smarts is another learning from experience kind of modality. Um, <clears throat> so, but at, at some point, it's going to need to take exposure to life to understand uh, what these excellences are like and maybe what recommends them. Okay. And this is something that really does separate Aristotle out from um, some of the other, uh, well, I mean, maybe it does make him unique. Uh, Kant and Mill both have ways in which uh, exp being informed from experience is pretty important. But for Aristotle, it, it's, it's kind of at the ground level. Aristotle is very willing to um, lean on experience as sort of the epistemic basis of justification for figuring out what's good and bad and about things. He's given this kind of theoretical framework, but he's really um, going to say that all the details are going to get filled in by experience. He's just giving kind of the basic model of the logic of how you would think about your experiences to inform these judgments of 
what's excellent and what's not excellent. So, so experience really matters. In fact, uh, it was just a little anecdote for Aristotle. Um, you can totally disagree with him about this, and it doesn't mean you're going to disagree with the rest of his theory automatically, so this isn't like a deal breaker. Um, and I think Aristotle would probably revisit this judgment if he was alive today because the world's conditions are different. But back in ancient Athens, Aristotle does say <clears throat> that um, no one should study ethics or do philosophy until they're 30. And the reason he has is, one, when you're young, you're more impulsive, so you're not taking into account the whole picture, which maybe isn't totally fair. Two, he says, though, you just lack experience. And you need experience of things to be able to be in a position to know what are the things to be weighing. You need to be kind of savvy and aware of these things. Now, I, I don't think he would, if pressed, really um, lean on a particular age as being one that something magical happens. I know plenty of 30-year-olds who are far less mature than 18-year-olds or something like that. You know, like the things like that happen. Um, but arguably, a big matter here of like what's the difference there is amount of experience I mean just being older doesn't necessarily mean you have a wider range of diverse experiences and two temperament you know so temperament can happen in, at a different pace too but anyway that that's just a small anecdote to illustrate how much Aristotle thinks experience is going to be necessary here but let's go back to the lecture notes and talk about <clears throat> the kind of conditions that Aristotle has for um, uh, how to figure out which of these goods need to be given a bigger role to play in the excellent life and and which ones should get less. So in no particular order here, Aristotle offers these four values. Um, he says the excellent or best ends, the, one, the kinds of things that we could put in the excellent life are things that are going to be complete, self-sufficient, uniquely human, and stable. So, and just as a, uh, maybe a quick illustration before we get started here, is it a human, this is my like absurd example to illustrate Aristotle's thinking here, um, is it a human function to burp the star-spangled banner? Yes. You could train yourself to be really good at burping out the star-spangled banner. Um, so that, you know, you could do it better or worse, you know, more recognizably that tune, less recognizably that tune, etc., etc. Um, but that's not something you should probably be devoting most of your life to. So that's kind of to illustrate how Aristotle would say, you don't have to be excellent at everything. There's some things that take higher priority than others. Like being a good friend is way more important than being able to burp the Star Spangled Banner excellently, just as an illustration. And how are we going to tell the difference, though? We can make some intuitive judgments about that, but what are our intuitions sensitive to, according to Aristotle? It's these four variables. That's what he has in mind. Let's first talk about complete. What's a complete good? It's something that has value intrinsically. It's worth pursuing for itself. Um, it's not good based on something else. This idea you're already very familiar with from both Mill and from Kant but especially from Kant, with his contrast between hypothetical and categorical imperatives. Um, a hypothetical imperative is basically saying this thing is good conditioned on something else. Like, I uh, remember my um, discussion of being a good, um, uh, being a, being a um, good ninja, um, but I'm a pacifist, right? Like, whether it's good to do this action, well, that's a good action if what you're trying to do is kill someone stealthily, but is killing someone stealthily a good thing? You know, the skill itself, <clears throat> the values of my abilities as a ninja don't tell me that. So uh, ninja abilities are not complete. They're not good for themselves alone. Neither would skill or excellent at money making for Aristotle. Being good at making money is only really valuable in as much as money is valuable. And what you do with the money is what's really going to determine this not um, the ability to make money all on its own, right? That doesn't have intrinsic value. Something like being a good friend, Aristotle says, does have intrinsic value. It doesn't matter whether being a good friend makes you money or gets you anything else. It is something valuable for itself. Same thing with pursuit of wisdom or knowledge or truth. That's something worth valuing for itself. Pleasure is something that could be complete, arguably. It's something we value for its own sake. Like when I'm 
when I take a long walk on the beach and enjoy the sunset, you know, is that something I do for the sake of uh, mental hygiene? Well, maybe. But I also could just do it for its own sake. It's just something I value all on its own. So the goods that are complete are the ones that we pursue not for the sake of some further end or purpose, but are kinds of ends in themselves. Intrinsic versus extrinsic or instrumental value. That's the idea of completeness. Self-sufficiency is really tricky. And actually, when I've talked with students before about this, I find that it's easy to mix this up with completeness. And I want to kind of distinguish them really carefully here. If a good is self-sufficient, that means that it's making, this is my favorite way of putting it, it uh, makes a big splash in making your overall life a valuable one. And a good could be complete without being self-sufficient. So, for example, um, I really like board games, board games, you saw maybe some stack of board games behind me here in the video. Um, I love board games, I love playing them, and I, I value them for other extrinsic things, like they're a really great way to like interact with other people. I like the social aspects of them, how you're all sitting around the table and having this kind of shared experience that you have to create together. I think that's pretty cool. You could play games to try to increase your analytic abilities. Um, like I'm planning on using uh, my board game hobby as a way to offset um, late age dementia when I'm in a nursing home. Um, that's, that's a benefit it can have, but I also just play them for their own sake. I just love board games and the experience of playing them all on their own. I will read rule books for board games on the bus, uh, cause I find them interesting. I just find it a valuable activity all by itself, even if other good things come from it. But if my life, and this is this right here, this note in my lecture notes is Aristotle's test for determining self-sufficiency. If I'm trying to figure out, like, how much value does my excellence with board games, like my ability to understand them, to appreciate them, to be good at playing them with other people, which kind of is a important social skill, right? Like, being someone that people would want to play a board game with rather than the last person that they would invite to play a board game with, right? Those are, there's some excellences there that I could develop. But if I was really good at all that stuff, if that was the only thing that I had going for me, in my life my life would not be very meaningful it would be a pretty pretty empty life I mean board games might be valuable for their own sake or like eating a cookie but if that's all you've got in your life that life isn't really valuable and there might be some goods that you know, well you might first think no good is capable of making your life valuable if that's all you had right but the, the question here is sort of like how much does it contribute to your life being a meaningful, valuable one if it just looking at that all by itself? Taken in isolation, your life is still worth living. It still has value to it. That's the kind of test that Aristotle sets up for self-sufficiency. So um, let me think about... Um, th this is my favorite example. Um, well, actually, okay, I've got a couple of them. Um, one of them is Aristotle's, actually. So uh, I'll take his first. Um, I've, I've met some people like this in my life before, um, people who have nothing, um, people who, uh, like, I remember right, right before I went to grad school, um, here, I'm going to just maybe go make this a little more human here with my visual image. Um, right before I went to grad school, I remember I was hanging around in Ballard and I was waiting for a friend to, uh, to hook up and go have some beers, um, and hang out. And... I uh, struck up a conversation with this homeless man who was stacking rocks, um, and we shared a cigarette and kind of started chatting and stuff. We ended up talking for a couple hours, and uh, I find out that he's uh, he had a philosophy PhD, and this isn't the thing about philosophy. I mean, you can don't have to be scared of a philosophy degree and that you're unemployable, but he had a lot of life stuff happen to him and done on his luck and that kind of thing, and... Um, he at this point he has a wife who is a lawyer divorced him uh, financially ruined doesn't have any family doesn't have any friends I mean all the kinds of things that we think of as being part of a good life were kind of gone um, but he still had philosophy and he still was very much a sharp uh, philosophical mind I really had a wonderful time talking with him 
um, it was it was we had some very interesting conversations. I don't remember the details anymore because um, it was so long ago, and I really wish I did. But I, I have very fond memories of it, and I remember those impressions that I had. And I kind of like to think of him as, as um, an example of what Aristotle is talking about when he, he sort of talks about such a person theoretically at the very end of the Nicomachean Ethics. But um, I met an actual person who seems to fit this description. And the his ability with wisdom and his ability to engage in the space of meaning, of truth-seeking, um, still gave his life value. It made it a meaningful one, even with everything else being gutted from his life. Um, and that might go to show just how self-sufficient that value of truth and wisdom is, um, and philosophical excellence and ability, um, that he's still able to participate with that. I mean, er, remember the thing about resources, we're going to come to that in a second. That's actually one thing. You like don't need a lot of resources to do philosophy. There's There's room for excellence there, even without a lot of opportunity. He needs some opportunity, but um, life provides tons of opportunity for philosophy. Another example I like to offer here is kind of a romantic um, tale. Like, um, maybe you've read stories kind of like this. It's kind of a motif, I think, of sorts in romantic narratives. But imagine two people who don't have anything else. They, they don't have any education. They don't have any artistic sensibilities. They're maybe not even really philosophers. They don't have the wisdom thing going on, although it would be hard to completely eliminate it from this scenario, and you'll see why in a second. Um, but um, they don't have any money. They don't have um, opportunities for a career, meaningful career, friends and family, no friends, family's all dead, but they have each other. They might even be like social outcasts, um, like... Uh, part of an oppressed group, like just nothing going, but they have each other and their relationship is so solid. They're such good lovers of each other. Um, that excellence is just so robust. Um, you know, you might imagine the, this couple kind of at the end of their life, looking back on it all and saying, you know what? Our life was pretty shitty. There's a lot of sucky things in it. But the fact that I was able to share it with you and in this relationship, it made it worth living and I would live it again. You know, that kind of sentiment, that to take an excellence that you could have that sentiment for is sort of this test of self-sufficiency that Aristotle has in mind. Like this, even if everything else is out, that won't make your life an excellent life overall. Like, because it's better to have all the goods, right? This patchwork quilt full of excellences. But if you need to gauge like how good, how important is this piece? How much of central significance should it be given? Taking it in isolation, asking how big of a splash does it make in making your overall life valuable and meaningful, that's a good test to kind of gauge that. that that's what Aristotle has in mind here with the, the self-sufficiency variable. Sorry, that one took a little while to explain, but I hope I gave a, a nice, robust uh, picture for you. I think self-sufficiency is one of the trickiest ones and one of the most easily misunderstood. Okay, um, the third one, unique human function, that was on that list. Unique human function. This one, I doesn't need a whole lot to say about it. Um, Aristotle's got, uh, he's kind of like Kant in that he's a systematic philosopher, and he got, he has his own like philosophical idiosyncrasies, and one of them is categorizing things. In fact, uh, Aristotle is uh, who we uh, are indebted to for binomial nomenclature in biology, you know, like genus, species, and organizing organisms in the tree of life and all that kind of stuff. That comes from Aristotle. And the the things that Aristotle is using theoretically to organize like a taxonomy of species or anything else in reality, which he'll do it for everything in reality, um, is really the same as what we do today. Now, nowadays, it's very much informed with evolution and stuff like that, but you still see... Um, differentiating species, even in an evolutionary context, based on their functions. Based on when, okay, this, this you know, gene pool came out of this gene pool, but now the mutations are such that it's different enough to call it a different species. So, like, take human beings. We have a lot of differences in diversity, but we're all the same species, right? We're not something fundamentally different. We're not 
calling different races different species of human. Um, we're we're all Homo sapiens. We're all in that genus species, right? Um, because we share all these kind of really fundamental functions, biological functions and characteristics. That's how Aristotle thinks about organizing things in his categorization structure as well. That he, do, he, do, he does with everything. Not all living things, but everything in reality he does in this way. When it comes to human beings, Aristotle classifies us in a very special category of what he calls a rational animal. So we've got all the traits that animals have, which are different from plants. Plant, uh, well, yeah, I don't care about the details too much here, but in case you're curious, plants have the nutritive function. They take in nutrients and grow and reproduce and things like that. Um, we share that function with plants, so do anim other non-human animals. Um, but animals got something different going on because they move. They have an animus. They, that's what they're called animals, right? That's where this all comes from. Um, animals are able to move of their own accord. They exhibit this kind of spontaneous behavior that makes them different from plants. Humans share that with animals too. But humans have another function that other animals don't. That's the capacity to reason. And Aristotle thinks that's unique to human beings. It's what makes us special. I think if he was alive today, he'd have to concede that point. Because at this point, um, our best work in cognitive science suggests that humans are not the only rational creatures that exist, even in our planet much less in the cosmos if you want to think about sentient aliens and stuff like that. Uh, but even on our planet, we're not the only beings that have this rational capacity or this rational function. So um, I think you'd have to concede that. Um, but because he thinks it is unique to us, he's like, well, dang, if this is a function that's unique to a being, then it's got to be at a central part of the definition for what is a good version of that thing. It better be performing that function excellently. So that that's why the unique human function thing shows up, and that's why reason gives some even more added significance. But I, I, I think this could probably be cut from Aristotle's account, and not much is lost. You still get the priority of reason as a basic condition for eudaimonia generally, for human excellence generally, because uh, regardless of whether other beings have it too, it's definitely central to our existence. If you just look at humans all by themselves, uh, reason is ubiquitous, formative, fundamental element of, of what we are. So performing that function will be pretty important. The final one that's really of note is stability, the stable um, criteria here. And I think this is where I'm going to leave the lecture tonight because we're coming up on two hours and I, I feel pretty good about where we're at. Uh, we'll, we'll get into all of uh, Aristotle's moral psychology stuff next time. And by the way, and this is, I guess, in keeping with what I just talked about, code word tonight will be for this new board game I got. Um, here we go. You even get a, a version of it there. Habitats. Oh, it's mirrored in the video. Dang it. But Habitats, that's the code word for tonight. I'm really excited about that game. It looks really cool. Um, just got it today in the mail. So that's a code word. But I'm going to leave you with um, Aristotle and stability. Now... This is the criteria I was alluding to earlier when I said that Aristotle was going to qualify this whole um, reliance on the world to cooperate for us to live excellent lives. Um, he says, you know, again, we're thinking about of all the excellences that humans are capable of, these different functions that we could perform, which ones are going to get at the center? Which ones are we going to give more priority to or devote more resources and attention and effort toward? Aristotle thinks those excellences which are not as dependent on the world's cooperation to realize, should get a higher priority. They're more important for a person being good. There's no way to completely divorce your existence apart from fate. From And I don't mean fate in some really predestination kind of crap. But there, I mean, in terms of just, you're a part of a world, and the world affects your life. And there's no getting around that. But certainly, if we're going to talk about an example of a human that's at the very best, it's someone who's able to kind of navigate that a little bit. Um, and even the things that we're asking out of humans to do excellently, um, the ones that are maybe more meaningful or important are the ones that depend more on us for their success. Can maybe not get that to a zero point, but the less that a good is reliant on the world to be realized, then the more important it should, uh, more important position it should hold in the excellent life. That's Aristotle's idea. So the more contingent a good is, it's kind of similar to Kant. 
Um, the more contingent a good is, the less sort of significance it should have in the tapestry of this patchwork quilt of the excellent life. And Aristotle presses on that standard in multiple places in the Nicomachean Ethics. So I, I kind of like picking it out for special significance because Aristotle seems to give it a lot of significance um, and, and I would say plausibly so here. It's really interesting because um, if sometimes Aristotle has this elitist kind of vibe that he gives off, this is a very strong indication that he's not so elitist about stuff. So that the kind of concern that I'll just be born into an unfortunate situation so I can't be the excellent person, I think this uh, principle by Aristotle ameliorates that a little bit um, in that it's something he's sensitive to. So it also, I, I mean, there's some funny stories about Aristotle, like he was reportedly very vain about his physical appearance, like beauty was a big thing for him, so he'd wear flashy robes and he wore earrings apparently and sometimes would do his hair in weird ways. Uh, we've got some historical reports of him being kind of glam, I guess you could say. Um, but I actually think that like beauty is going to be one of those things that would actually probably get deprioritized for Aristotle, even though he kind of makes, he puts some emphasis on it um, in some of his writings um, and in his person. But that's the kind of thing, it's like uh, physical beauty. I mean, even not getting into all the subjectivity that's involved with culturally relative standards of beauty, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's all real stuff. But at a, at a certain point, whatever your ideal of beauty is, um, life is going to get in the way of that. Like, that is going, that's a losing battle uh, to a certain extent. I mean, I, you, could, you could have some different notions of beauty that um, uh, kind of are tailored around it being sort of universal and not dependent on the circumstances. And that's maybe fair enough. But that's not, it's definitely not how Aristotle's thinking about it. But in the way that he's thinking about more conventional notions of beauty, um, certainly under by his own lights, that should get deprioritized pretty far. Um, I think this is, um, I think one of the really, really interesting um, spaces for uh, virtue ethicists is in conversation with issues, very current issues right now about, say, debates around ableism. I don't know how many of you watching this video are familiar with um, that discussion. Ableism is kind of like in the same uh, wheelhouse as sexism uh, or racism, things like that. It's a sort of a prejudice. Uh, well, it's as an ism, it's referring to um, the way in which people who have disabilities are um, uh, oppressed or not given privileged status in society, look, look down, prejudice can be a part of this, but it, uh, a lot of times it's about bigger issues like um, society uh, thinking like of it as being a bad condition, that getting a disability is something negative or it diminishes your, your happiness or your ability for your life to be meaningful and things like that. And able, uh, people who talk about advoca advocation for issues in the ableism discussion are always trying to like rethink that, of being like, um, why are we treating these things as negative characteristics? I mean, Aristotle, strictly speaking, would probably be guilty of ableism. If you take him literally in a lot of his passages, um, if you wouldn't be able to walk, there's a bunch of excellences that you're not capable of. Aristotle does like the physical stuff too, like the Olympic kind of thing is is part of this achieving excellence uh, in your full person, like multimodal sort of thing, body, mind, spirit. And But I think there's room for Aristotle's virtue ethics to be responsive to the concerns in the contemporary discussion around ableism. Um, and rethinking like, okay, what human functions do these conditions really get in the way of, and how important are those for being an excellent person? And a lot of them I don't think are going to be all that relevant. Um, I, I was just having a discussion with a student the other day about ableism and one of the big kind of being ideas around it is how, um, you know, imagine if we were all um, in wheelchairs, if like 90% of human population were in wheelchairs, uh, we would build our buildings in a totally different way. To put it, putting stairs, you never see stairs. No one would build buildings with stairs if 90% of the population was around in wheelchairs. What really is a disability is a social circumstance that isn't allowing people to, that isn't enabling and empowering people to use what they've got going on in order to achieve these functions. So is there a way again in which 
excellence of function is dependent on circumstances? Yeah, and that's something Aristotle is bringing up. But also, the things that are really worth pursuing are not the things that should be dependent on those contingent factors. Right? So doing a function in a certain specific way that some people are in a position to do and other people not, that maybe isn't the thing that really matters here. That's not what's super important. What import, what's important is the ultimate end, the thing that could be done in multiple ways, and we should be creating opportunities and accessibility for those other opportunities to happen too. Um, so I, I think a lot of Aristotle's reasoning here, especially around stability, um, uh, are things that could definitely be relevant for that contemporary discussion. I think that's a good illustration of what Aristotle's got in mind too and how it might get applied. Um, Aristotle's definitely one of these people, one of these philosophers who I think it's important to look at what they're doing theoretically and not always uh, what they say as representatives of their own perspective. I mean, just if nothing else, Aristotle is a huge misogynist. That's just something to know about him. Uh, he has a very backwards, terrible, non-progressive view of women. And nothing about his virtue ethics requires this. Not, I don't, I, you probably haven't gotten the sense of that this whole time tonight. Not been like, hmm, this vision of excellence for humanity really is looking like it's uh, treating women like shit. Like, you probably didn't get that sense. But Aristotle goes that way with it in his own comments. Um, so that's something to be careful about. Uh, we're, we're just going to focus on the theory. And uh, Aristotle, the person, has you know, some reasons to be concerned about him. Um, he's definitely got some big moral blind spots here. But the principles that he's offering, um, we could make good use of without falling into some of those traps. I, I, think, I think it's pretty fair to say that um, standard Aristotle, Aristotle talking about Aristotelianism, probably ableist, definitely misogynist. Probably racist too. Yeah, actually, there's some passages I've my friends have told me are pretty racist. But you know, even with all of those things, he's put together some ideas here which have some merit, um, and that we could we don't have to use in those effed up ways that he did. So, okay. So at this point in the lecture, you've gotten kind of a complete picture of Aristotle's vision for what we're aiming at with our lives, or what we should be aiming toward. Um, it, our goal is to try to be excellent people. We want to live the excellent life. It's not all on us, but we have a space to do something about that. Um, this is this is what we would this is what would be ideal. Would be good. That's what we should be pursuing. Um, next time on Thursday, I'll talk about the guidance Aristotle gives us for how we could actually do that. Like how to, how do human beings work um, so that we could manifest that excellence. Um, so we'll talk more about that, and then we'll do our recap for the whole, uh, this whole unit on um, this kind of ethical theory crash course thing. Please, 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 please post on that discussion board prior to Thursday's session so that we can have a rich discussion about that, and I can have a bunch of stuff to inform the work I'm going to do with you then. But um, I'm going to call that video here. We're over two hours. This is pretty good. So uh, thanks to the two of you for sticking around in the chat this late. Some people had to bug out. But... Um, you've got your code word, and I think that's that's everything. So I'll call this this video to a close. Have a good week, and I'll see you back here on Thursday.